to deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us give thanks unto the beneficent and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us unto him, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord our the Almighty, to guard us in all peace this holy day and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord God, the Almighty, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for every condition concerning every condition. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life in all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, and the rising up of enemies hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this holy place that is yours. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us. For it is you who have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. By the grace, compassion, and love of mankind, of your only begotten Son, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, the adoration are due unto you, who with him and the Holy Spirit, the life giver, who is of one essence with you, now and at all times, unto the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercy. Blot out my iniquity. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only I have sinned and done evil before you. You are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities and in sins my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth. You have manifested to me the hidden unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with your hyssop and I shall be purified. You shall wash me and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear gladness and joy. The humble bone shall rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your presence. Give me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I shall teach transgressors your ways, and the ungodly man shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. For if you desired sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, and do good pleasure unto Zion. Let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Offering and burnt sacrifices. Then they shall offer calves upon your altar. Alleluia. Choice and end the sunset prayer of this blessed day. We offer to Christ our King and our God, beseeching him to forgive us our sins from the Psalms of our Father David, the prophet and King. May his blessings be with us all. Amen. All together. Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Let all the peoples praise him. For his mercy has been established upon us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Alleluia. Unto you I have lifted up my eyes, O you who dwell in heaven. Behold, as the eyes of servants are unto the hands of their masters, and as the eyes of a maidservant to the hands of her mistress, so our eyes are toward the Lord our God until he has pity on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt, and our soul has been exceedingly filled. Give the reproach to those who prosper, and contempt to the proud. Alleluia. Luxatio Theos, someone holy, 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 reading from the Gospel. According to our teacher, St. Luke the Evangelist, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered Simon's house, and Simon's wife, mother, was taken with a great fever. So they requested him concerning her, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever and left her. And immediately she arose and served them. When the sun was setting, all those who had any sick with every disease brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the devils also came out of many crying out, saying, You are the Christ, Son of God. And he rebuked them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew he was Christ. May we be to God forever and ever. Amen. The righteous one is sacredly sa scarcely saved. Sha where shall I, the sinner, appear? The burden and heat of the day I did not endure because of the weakness of my humanity. But, O merciful God, count me 
with the fellows of the eleventh hour, for behold in iniquities as it was conceived, and in sins my mother bore me. Therefore I do not dare to lift up my eyes to heaven, but rather I rely on the abundance of your mercy and love for mankind, crying out and saying, God forgive me a sinner and have mercy on me. Every iniquity I did with prudence and activity, and every sin I committed with eagerness and diligence, and of all torment and judgment I am worthy. Therefore prepare for me the ways of repentance, O Lady the Virgin. For to you I appeal, and through you I seek intercession. Upon you I call to help me, lest I may be put to shame. And when the soul, my soul departs my body, attend to me, and defeat the conspiracy of the enemies. Shut the gates of Hades, lest they might swallow my soul. O you blameless bride of the true bridegroom. We'll say the second one together. Hasten, O Savior, to open to me the fatherly bosoms, for I wasted my life in pleasures and lusts, and the day has passed by me and vanished. Therefore now I rely on the richness of your never-ending compassion. So then do not forsake a submissive heart which is in need of your mercy. For unto you I cry, O Lord, humbly, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son, so make me as one of your hired servants. O Lord, hear us, have mercy on us, and forgive us our sins. Amen. Holy, holy, holy Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. Have mercy on us, O God, the Father, the Almighty, the Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. O Lord, God of hosts, be with us, for we have no helper nor hardships and tribulations but you. Absolve, forgive, and remit, O God, our transgressions, those which we have committed willingly and those which we have committed unwillingly, those which we have committed knowingly and those which we have committed unknowingly, the hidden and manifest. O Lord, forgive us for the sake of your holy name. Let it be according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our sins. O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for every amen. We thank you, our compassionate King, for you have granted us to pass this day in peace, and brought us to the evening thankfully, and made us worthy to behold daylight until evening. Lord, accept our glorification which is offered now, and save us from the trickeries of the adversary, and abolish all the snares which are set against us. Grant us in this coming night peace without pain, or anxiety, or unrest, or illusion so that when we pass it in peace and chastity and rise up for praises and prayers. And thus at all times and everywhere, we glorify your holy name together with the Father who is incomprehensible and the Holy Spirit, the life giver, who is of one essence with you, now and at all times unto the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy on us, O God, and have mercy on us, who at all times and in every hour, in heaven and on earth, is worshipped and glorified. Christ our God, the good, the long-suffering, and the great in compassion who loves the righteous and has mercy on the sinners of whom I am chief, who does not wish the death of the sinner, but rather that he returns and lives, who calls all to salvation for the promise of the blessings to come. Lord, receive from us our prayers in this hour and every hour. Ease our life and guide us to fulfill your commandments. Sanctify our spirits, cleanse our bodies, conduct our thoughts. Heal our diseases, forgive our sins, deliver us from every evil grief and distress of heart. Surround us by your holy angels, that by their camp we may be guarded and guided and attain the unity of faith and a knowledge of your imperceptible and infinite glory. For you are blessed forever. Amen. O Lord, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you're sitting in the back, come to the front, please. And if you're standing in the back, come to the front.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, I wanted to welcome to us today, um, Kirillo Swanis, or as many of us know him as Kiro. Um, Kiro today will be speaking to us uh, with the title, Faith and the Environment, a Christian Response to the Climate Crisis. Um, this will be the first lecture of um, um, multiple, where um, the theme for the month of December is Conviction to Causes. Um, as you know, in December, a lot of organizations reach out for um, end-of-year donations. Um, and so um, you get to see and you get to learn about many different organizations that require um, assistance or support or help um, from church level, us, um, to many other uh, causes, such as the environment, um, which can range in terms of climate, in terms of uh, 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 pollution, which affects the climate, um, uh, and many other things uh, in that umbrella, um, among uh, sickness and hospitals, the medical field, um, poverty. I mean, there are many different causes that um, we as a people can support. Um, and so it's good to be aware and it's good to be educated in terms of these backgrounds. Um, so I wanted to, again, welcome Kiro. Kiro uh, Kiro's background um, is he's, uh, he was a major in politics um, and also he um, right now is uh, getting his master's from Columbia University um, with international, in international development. Um, he's very passionate about, um, about this topic, um, not just uh, in regards to the environment, but many uh, social um, um, aspects of, of, um, of society. Um, and so uh, Kiro, in my opinion, is the best person for us to talk to when it comes to uh, these topics. So again, welcome, Kiro. Thank you for your passion, and we can't wait to hear from you. Hey, guys. Uh, good turnout. Sorry about the weather today. I'm really glad you were <laughs> able to make the trek. I guess it's appropriate for this topic, for the weather to be horrible. All right, I was trying to think on my way here, how am I going to make that joke? And nothing really came to mind, so I guess that was good enough. Right? I heard a few chuckles. So there we go. That's a good start. Um, so I've done this before here, this, this exact topic. I believe it was now two years ago. Um, and I've been kind of on a mission to spread this message to as many Coptic communities as I can. And I've been to a few other churches. and. Every time I do it, I, I learn a little bit more um, about how, uh, how it's received, how, we can, um, how, can, how can we tailor our response to the climate crisis as Orthodox Christians. Um, and hopefully, if you are one of the people that was here when I did it the first time, hopefully you see some improvement. And regardless, I would love feedback afterwards. You know, this is a learning process. This is not the kind of topic that we are accustomed to hearing, I think, in churches uh, at youth meetings. And so I'm learning with you guys, all right? So please feel free to come up to me afterwards or ask questions at any point. Uh, you can raise your hand and, and we can stop and talk. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. So um, first of all, because, you know, this, I love the, you know, the focus for this month, conviction of causes. And this is a cause that's going to require a lot of conviction to handle. Um, before we get into what climate change is, though, I have to address that uh, because it's an issue that affects the public, that affects society at large, that means that we have to somewhat delve into politics. And that can get kind of messy, especially when we're talking about it in church. And very often um, uh, there's hesitation to approach issues that are politically controversial. Uh, but I want everyone to understand that, you know, when we talk about climate change, we're talking about environmental stewardship of God's creation. We're talking about looking after our brothers and sisters in Christ. People are suffering because of this issue. It's not just a matter of protecting the trees, although that's very important. People, people are dying because of this. And if we have any moral obligation to society, then we do have to look at this issue, all right? Um, these are all spiritual concerns. Um, when it comes to that hesitation with politics, uh, I think, uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. put it really well. Um, basically, his point was that, you know, we, we have this hesitation to talk about political issues because there's power involved, and sometimes people can just pursue power for greed, but power without love is reckless and abusive, 
and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. I think there's a beautiful way to put it um, in terms of how we should think about any kind of political issue. The reason why we would talk about politics at all is to do good, is to do God's work. And that's what differentiates us from others who, uh, who pursue political uh, goals for their own, uh, you know, for greed or for uh, ambition or whatever it is. Uh, as Christians, we're here to do God's work. It's about love. Sure. Um, I read the, uh, so okay, I'll talk, start from the top. All of us have our moral convictions and concerns and so often have problems with power. There is nothing wrong with power if power is used correctly. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. So again, I thought that was just a, a beautiful quote. Um, and straight from the Bible, Proverbs is a, one of my uh, favorite verses, honestly. P speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. And we're going to learn today that there are many people who are destitute because of this issue. Pope Francis is someone who I'm going to lean on a lot in this uh, presentation. Pope Francis, obviously the head of the Catholic Church, um, uh, has been a, a leading voice on the climate change issue. And we're going to talk a lot more about that later. Um, and you know, there are different ways that we serve God. When we think of mission, you know, there's proclaiming the good news of Christ's kingdom, to teach and baptize and nurture new believers. There's several others that pertain directly to this. So like I said, to respond to human need by loving service, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence. These are things that are gonna be all relevant to climate change. Now, it's clear that we are living in a climate moment, That's as I wanna put it. Um, according to polls, the vast majority of Americans want the federal government to do more to protect the environment. The vast majority of people are starting to realize that there is a climate change problem. Uh, there have been unprecedented and massive climate protests in cities around the world, mostly led by young people, including um, anyone here heard of Greta Thunberg, 16 years old? Such an inspiration. Um, we have people, uh, we have young kids, high schoolers, leaving school to demonstrate. Um, and. <laughs> And there have been, uh, been protests recently in New York and London. Uh, it, it just been, it's been really inspiring. We'll show some pictures later. Um, for the first time ever, climate change was brought up in a major US presidential uh, debate. The first time ever. Think about that. There's so many issues that we talk about. And the first time ever it was brought up this year. Uh, and of course, the evidence is around us everywhere. The extreme weather, there's a new, uh, there's basically a new natural weather disaster every week, right? Um, and in 2018, there were at least 10 events that cost a billion dollars each, four of, four of them that cost seven billion each. We just had the California wildfires. They've decimated parts of California. Um, the Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, that's an example of one of the recent hurricanes uh, that just literally left, sent them back to the Middle Ages, basically. Parts of the Bahamas were just completely uh, uninhabitable. Uh, Record-breaking heat waves in Europe in uh, summer 2019. These are just a few examples, and there's literally lists and lists and lists of these that I could have picked from. Uh, flooding crises. Um, the it, it, Earth is angry. <laughs> you can almost feel it. Uh, every every week there is a new disaster. Uh, you know, it seems like this that we have to. You know, these are people. People used to live in that community. <laughs> that could have been your home. You know. Um, I have friends who live in California who were affected by those fires. Uh, this is, this, guess what that used to be? That used to be an airport. <laughs> uh, there was like, there's the little runway, that's part of it right there. Um, that should not happen. And it's just, it's, it's tragic. Um, you know, it's like, it's nature is so angry at us. Uh, and in response to all this, you know, we have a lot of young people being active about it. And, what I hope to accomplish today is to help us join that movement, help us channel our faith into doing something about this. All right, so I want to quickly run through the science. Of, sure. Great question. 
Um, he's going to repeat it because people you, are streaming. Uh, the difference between the frequency of disasters happening now, like California wildfire now and let's say like 100 years ago. Good question. So I was about to get into the science. You beat me to it. So climate change does not cause uh, extreme weather or natural disasters. But what it does is that it makes them not only more frequent, but much more severe. And that's what we're dealing with now. Um, all those things that I mentioned, the heat waves, the flooding, the hurricanes, the typhoons, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, these things have always occurred, but they are occurring much more now with much more frequency and with much more intensity. We are, it, they cost a lot more, they are killing a lot more people, they are displacing people. Um, we're gonna get into all the effects of this stuff, but that's the difference. Um, and really quickly, just to explain what climate change is, on a very basic level, when we burn greenhouse gases, mostly coal, oil, gas, um, that leads to increased increased levels of carbon dioxide that are released into the atmosphere. Um, and what it, what it does, it has something called the, green, uh, the greenhouse gas effect. It, it gets trapped in the atmosphere and basically uh, the planet just keeps getting warmer and warmer. Um, and one of the things that happens is that the Arctic, which is full of ice, starts to melt. And when, and when it melts, the, uh, the waters rise, uh, you know, all the oceans rise. And where do most people live? by the coast, in coastal cities, um, believe it or not. But in our lifetimes, there are gonna be whole island nations that won't exist anymore. They're gonna be underwater because of global warming. Um, just to put some numbers around it, scientists measure global warming by the rise in temperature relative to pre-industrial levels. So, you can, so sometimes you might hear, oh, we, we went up by a degree, we wanna limit it to 1.5. Basically, we've already increased by one degree Celsius. There is a major agreement between all the nations of the world except the United States now, um, called the Paris Agreement, uh, to limit the rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, but we're on track right now for four, and I'm gonna explain how disastrous that would be to the world, and how large parts of the world will literally be uninhabitable. We will not be able to sustain a large portion of our population if we get to four degrees, if we even get to two degrees. Um, so that's just the numbers that I, uh, I wanted to mention, I don't know why it's cut off at the bottom there, but um, there's also just environmental degradation uh, in general. Even without climate change, there's air pollution, water pollution. Um, anyone here live near Newark? Newark, New Jersey, have you heard about the lead uh, poisoning crisis there? Um, so in Flint, Michigan, and now New York, New, uh, New York, New Jersey, and a few other cities, there's been major crises where um, there's been lead poisoning seeping into the wells and into the, into the water infrastructure. Um, literally, the mayor was on a, a street corner handing out bottles of water in New York a few weeks ago. Uh, so that's one of the things that's been in the news. Um, I want to stress, this is a politically controversial issue, but it shouldn't be. If we just listen to the scientists, 97% of climate scientists are in agreement. Climate change is real, and it's caused by us. Not nature, this is not a normal thing you know, that's going to pass. It's caused by us. Unfortunately, um, most Americans are starting to understand that. At least seven out of 10 believe climate change is happening. 58% understand it is mostly human cause, but obviously there's a lot of people that don't. Um, and the next slide is, I wanna explain why it's so controversial. This is a crisis that's driven by greed. Okay, the, uh, I, I, I really love this quote of Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and, pe and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And that other first quote kind of sums the whole thing up. The, the way we got into this mess is basically a disregard for human suffering in the pursuit of profit. All right? These, so anyone uh, know the story of uh, Exxon Mobil uh, in the 70s? And, no? Okay. <laughs> so Exxon, Exxon Mobil, which is one of the largest corporations in the world, obviously one of the largest oil companies in the world, was at the forefront of climate science in the 70s. They were working with the government to study this issue. We, back then, we didn't know that there was gonna be this crisis. Um, and basically, uh, if, you, if you search the hashtag Exxon knew, there's been this whole uh, investigation that's uncovered that Exxon knew exactly what would happen if we continued burning our energy supplies, our oil, our gas, and coal at the rates that we were doing, what would happen if we released all that carbon dioxide? And instead of, you know, warning the government, trying to switch to 
uh, alternative energy and, and other solutions that we're going to talk about, they funded decades of climate denial advertising and lobbied against climate legislation. And lots of companies follow the same playbook. Chevron, Shell, all these different corporations um, basically did not care at all about what they were doing to the planet, about the, the species that were going extinct because of them, uh, the global warming, the, the, the extreme weather that we've talked about. And they've made trillions of dollars in the process. Um, this is a very greed-oriented issue. Um, just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of all global emissions. The US, the United States, uh, which is only 5% of the world's population, we generate over a quarter of global carbon emissions since 1850. Whoops, sorry, what did I do? Um, and basically, though the rich have, are responsible for this, it's the poor that suffer the most, which makes this such an important Christian issue. You know, it's, it, 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 it's such an unequal thing where the people who contribute the least to these emissions, the inhabitants of the poorest countries in the world, are the ones who are going to suffer the most. Yeah. You know. Okay. I, I like what you're saying that. Uh, like it's our responsibility but since we were created since like men men were created um it's our job to look for resources people used to go from one place to another take the resources it's it's done they're just like used to go to a different place and uh, until we start finding water and start our, uh, uh, like start planting and like start, start settling and building and stuff so resources always like you always seek resources I understand your point. Now it's uh, it's now the resources leads to disaster, natural disaster. But um, still, like technology, uh, it's going. It's, it's like we have technology right right now, and this is this is part of it. Like you have to use whatever you have for resources in order to develop. Um, I think the problem is not to stop. I think the, the 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 question is what to do in order to find other things or other solutions to uh, reduce the pollution, not to stop whatever we're do doing right now. Uh, you got what I'm saying? It's not, it's not like, okay, like we have to go and like, okay, stop, let's say, um, all these projects or this, this researches. It's like, it's more like, what can we do? What, what can fi we figure out to, um, to decrease this kind of stuff, like not to stop it? Um, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, of course, there's going to be a major role for science and technology to play in terms of innovation. How do we, uh, you know, produce renewable energy? How do we, um, you know, promote conservation and sustainable development? All this stuff, and I'm going to get to some of that. Um, in terms of resources, though, I want to stress from a Christian perspective, God didn't just create the world for us to take. That's not what the, you know, we are supposed to be stewards, caretakers of the planet. You know, we don't have, we're not the dominant species that just comes in and we have a right to take and take advantage of everything that God created for us. Every part of this world is his creation, all right? And it's an act of love to create it. And I'm not saying we don't, of course we have to use the resources to exist, but we are on a whole different level right now. We have done much more than just, uh, you know, take what we need to survive. We have exploited. That's the difference. We have, we have actively taken more than we should, and um, as a society, we're paying the price now. What happened? Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers the question, but I think more, I'll address more of what you're saying as I go on, I think. But make sure you, I make sure I address it, okay? Guys, um, if we can hold off uh, questions till the end, till he's done with his presentation. So uh, there's only, there are about 7.6 billion people on the planet. We represent just 0.01% of all living things. Yet, since the dawn of civilization, humanity has caused the loss of, these are shocking numbers, 83% of wild mammals, 80% of marine mammals, 50% of plants, 15% of fish. Um, it's, it's absurd. Just in the last 40 years alone, um, 
half the number of wild animals have uh, ceased to exist because of us. We are undergoing a major biodiversity extinction crisis right now, um, and it's because of us. Uh, that picture, anyone ever, see, ever, uh, ever been to Australia, seen the, the coral reef? So beautiful, but it no longer is. Most of it looks like that right now. It used to be colorful and bright. And, uh, used to be a major tourist destination, and it no longer is. Um, it's quite sad, actually. Um, the, the United Nations is very clear. Climate change is, a, climate change is an existential threat to humanity. Um, uh, the World Health Organization uh, says that environmental risks cause about 13 million deaths a year. 13 million. Um, obviously, we talked about wild weather. It's worsening due to climate change, as I answered your question before. Uh, another example, um, Hurricane Maria that hit in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago. 5,000 people died, not just in the, in the initial hit. About 50 people died in the initial hit. 5,000 people died in the months afterwards because it's such a hard thing for governments to deal with, to come in and with disaster aid and, and to reach sick people in, uh, in deserted places, it's really difficult to deal with this. Um, it's a, also a very costly issue. Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, the, p the plans that are being put out there to fix climate change, they're too expensive. Not doing anything about climate change is extremely expensive. The U.S. spent a record $306 billion in 2017 on climate-related disasters, uh, and it just gets higher every year. Um, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because uh, it's a little bit repetitive. Um, climate change is absolutely a health emergency. Cost, uh, air, pollution alone, air pollution alone costs 7 million deaths worldwide. Um, I also want to stress that people think that it's just about the environment. Climate change affects every other issue. And I think Abuna touched, about, touched upon this in the beginning when he was introducing me. Um, you care about immigration, whether you want to build the wall or you want to take care of refugees, Climate change makes it worse. How? Well, first of all, think about a hurricane leaving people, tens of thousands of people homeless. Where do they go? They have to go somewhere and, and they become displaced. Um, and the IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration, it projects that the impacts of climate change could displace up to 200 million people by the year 2050. That's 25 times the population of New York City are gonna, be, have, are gonna have lost their homes because of the weather and are gonna need to go somewhere. They're going to be refugees, and many of them are going to want to come here. Um, agriculture. Many people are going to starve because of climate change. Uh, climate change could result in gro global crop yield losses of 30% by 2080. 30%. So there's eight, almost 8 billion people. Think about 30% of that, of the food we need to feed that population, will not be able to be grown. Uh, hunger and thirst. If we get to 2 degrees, 100 to 400 million more people could be at risk of hunger. One, one to two billion more people may no longer have adequate water. Anyone know what's going on in Egypt with the Nile River right now and Ethiopia? So Ethiopia is trying to build, everyone, I used to think when I was growing up that the Nile River was all ours. <laughs> it's just, it was just in Egypt. It's not just in Egypt. <laughs> it, it extends throughout Africa. Ethiopia is building a dam, honestly, and they have the right to. Uh, huh? But this, this dam is going to make a big difference in terms of the water supply that gets to Egypt. Anyway, this is just one example. My point is, there's going to be many more conflicts over resources because of this. Egypt is a country that relies tremendously on the Nile. It's one of our few good natural resources. The rest of the land is mostly desert. Um, and the Nile is drying up. It's getting, and we also don't take care of it. It's very polluted. And so there's... Every country has a different set of problems that are going to be related to this. It's going to look different for every country, but it's going to be disastrous for all of them. Um, there are reports that say that Egypt, at least 90% of the land will be uninhabitable by the year 2100. When I say uninhabitable, I mean people cannot live there. It's too hot to live there. There won't be access to water. Already parts of Egypt are like that, you know? So, um, and, and there are many other examples like this. Racism, uh, believe it or not. I, so. A lot of the effects of ecological hazards and climate disasters have the harshest effects on people of color, native tribes, uh, and low-income people. All right? it's the, the most disadvantaged people in society are the ones that suffer the most from this issue. Um, I don't know why the public health part is cut out, but uh, every medical association has put out so many reports recently this year in the United States saying that we have, this is a public health emergency. There's going to be so many more 
for example, infectious diseases that are going to be caused by these, not, uh, these weather events. Um, so now I want to get into the theology of creation care. Uh, how do we care for creation? How do we think about this as Christians? You know, what is our responsibility to God's creation now that we know that there's this disaster, this crisis going on um, that, is, that is hurting this creation? Uh, and we start right from the beginning. We go directly to the beginning, Genesis 1. Okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the story of creation is spelled out, how God created the sky, the earth, the waters, the plants, the animals, and mankind. And what does it say seven times? That it was good. That it was very good. This was an act of love. Right? God create, God's creation, this, you know, I can't stress enough, um, you know, we are indebted to him for this. Uh, the story of creation is so important, though, that even after it's, it's spelled out in Genesis 1, it's repeated again in chapter 2. Uh, verse 4 says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And again, it briefly spells out how plants, waters, and humans were created. Um, so it's a special emphasis that's placed on it right in the very beginning of the Bible. And then, to me, the most important part, and then God gives human beings the role in relation to creation. What does he say? Chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So I hope that answers uh, also Ramos' question. So the earth does not just exist for us to take advantage of it or for corporations to make money off of it or for us to build bigger and better skyscrapers or whatever it is. First and foremost, it exists for us to take care of it and to and to appreciate it and appreciate and cherish it as God's creation, all right? There's a piece of God in everything that he has created, including every single one of us. And when every act of environmental destruction is an act of violence against God himself, and that's how we have to think about it, all right? Our, ro our role is to work and take care of it. That is the first commandment in the Bible is that God gave us is to care for his creation, all right? And that's something to keep in mind. Um, there are so many Bible verses that I could touch upon. Um, this is an organization called Green Faith, one word. Um, you can look it up. Uh, it's an interfaith organization. It has lists from every faith, uh, you know, not just Christianity, and every denomination within Christianity. Um, teachings, documents, um, it just, it's a great resource to look up uh, all kinds of religious teachings on taking care of uh, the climate. Um, all right, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Um, you are called to care for creation, not only as responsible citizens, citizens, but as followers of Christ. That's Pope Francis. Again, I, I'm going to lean on him heavily throughout this presentation. Um, uh, another leading figure, uh, religious figure, uh, when it comes to climate change, is uh, the Patriarch Bartholomew of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, I believe it's called the, he's the ecumenical patriarch. Is that correct? Uh, so he's another leading figure. Him and Pope Francis are probably the, the most vocal of religious figures when it comes to climate change. And, and, I, and I love this quote here. You know, it's not just about how we interact with nature. Does anyone want to help me read, <laughs> do some reading? Bernardo, so you since you have a mic. <laughs> there are no two ways of looking at either the world or God. There is no distinction between human welfare and concern for ecological preservation. The way we relate to nature as creation reflects directly the way we believe in God as creator of all things. The sacredness with which we handle the, na the natural environment clearly mirrors the sacredness that we reserve for the divine. So I, I, I love that. Um, it kind of sums up what I was, uh, the point I was trying to make there. Uh, you know, we can't separate these things. You know, we think we can. We want to compartmentalize it. Um, and it's okay if you haven't thought about this issue before. But like, as the Pope, uh, as the Patriarch Bartholomew put it, uh, the sacredness with which we handle the natural environment clearly mirrors the sacredness that we reserve for God himself. Okay? Um, how am I doing on time? Good, okay. Uh, a little bit more uh, to just emphasize uh, you know, biblical narrative about how we should think about uh, this issue. Um, in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, uh, Jesus reminds us that whenever we care for those who are hungry, thirsty, naked, or imprisoned, we care for him. You know, what you do unto others, uh, it's as if you have done to him. We are called to care for the least of these. Right, climate change is creating a reality 
where there are more people than ever who are hungry, thirsty, and homeless. All right? We can't separate these issues from that. Um, there are ecological implications from the, the environmental crisis for every part of these verses. All right? I was hungry. Climate change, we talked about how climate change impacts where food is grown um, and how much food have. More people will go hungry. I was thirsty. There will be pollution of water systems that's already happening. Increased drought will make finding access to clean water much more difficult. I was homeless. Many people will be, will be displaced by uh, natural weather events, extreme weather. Um, it's already happening, uh, even here in the United States. Uh, again, all, all of this affects people every day right now. So Laudato Si, in 2015, Pope Francis published this uh, really kind of seminal work uh, as far as uh, faith in climate change. Um, and he really drives home the point that you cannot separate this issue from taking care of the poor and social justice, right? As Christians, you know, we have to think of this. Uh, he's made sure that the spiritual perspective is now an important part of the environmental discussion. Now when there's UN talks going on, there's, there's UN cl uh, climate conferences every year, there are big religious delegations that are sent from all the different churches and, and uh, Islamic groups and Jewish groups and Buddhist and Hindu and interfaith groups and atheists. It's, it's a major collaboration. Um, and Pope Francis had made, has made sure to emphasize to all Christians that our role in this is to make sure that the poorest, the people who are hurt the most are taken care of, just as Jesus did when he was here. On, you know, he always looked to the people who were the worst off, and that, and that is the message of this book that uh, Pope Francis published a few years back. Um, when this was published, it was published right before that Paris Agreement that I mentioned, and it was said that this had a big role in uh, pushing some of the hesitant countries to sign the agreement. Uh, so it was a major achievement, and so, and so it's just an example of faith actually you know, working with governments to do some good. Okay, um, mentioned a lot of the, some of this stuff already. So uh, this is basically the, the end. We're going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about some of the things we can do now. Um, and I know there's going to be questions after this. So this is this is a massive problem, a huge issue with so much to it. I could not cover anywhere near uh, you know a comprehensive uh, <laughs> review of all of it. Um, but based on what I what I've said today, I hope you have uh, enough of a perspective. To, uh, to at least take some of these actions in your life, okay? First of all, you know, we pray for a lot of different things. Prayer is a big, big and important part of our lives. Pray for this issue too. Pray for the planet. It matters. Of course it does. And we actually, we have lines in, our, in the liturgy uh, related to the environment that we pray um, every Sunday. Uh, pay attention to those. Um, we passed September 1st already, which is the World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation. Um, April, the first week of April is also a major interfaith climate change week, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a time for prayer and, um, and demonstrations and such, and it'll be all over the news and stuff. Um, it makes a difference even just to sign petitions and pledges. Get, make, put your voice out there, social media. Um, there, you know, online, you, could, you can just literally Google the Laudato Si pledge. You can sign that, Pope Francis's pledge, and there's instructions of things you can do to contribute. Um, we talked about fundraising. Of course, there's 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 definitely a need for money for this uh, for this kind of work. Uh, Pope Francis's global climate movement. Um, literally, if you Google if you Google uh, that, you will you will find it, um, and you'll be able to sign his petition and participate in this in this movement. Um, the Paris pledge as well is not just for governments; it's for congregations and individuals. Um, the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement this year. Uh, it was, is on its way to pulling out, but individual cities and states have continued uh, to do that work. Um, and so New York City, actually, New York City and New York State this year just passed two monumental environmental bills. And if, this, if I had done this lecture before then, I would have told you, hey, please call, call your councilmen and urge them to, uh, to you know, sign that bill. And so, sorry, oh yeah, there's a little bit more. <laughs> Oh, I keep screwing that up, I'm sorry. Uh, and so, uh, as far as uh, l legislation goes, okay, there's, there's always something you can do. Um, you should always be aware of who your representation is um, in, at every level of government, okay? Uh, I used to work for a congressman, and I can tell you, 
just calling the person that represents you and saying, oh, I'm concerned about this. Oh, can you vote, for, can you vote yes on this bill? Uh, or writing a letter or an email makes a big difference. They tally that up. And then they tell the congressman, hey, or the congresswoman, hey, uh, we got this many calls about this issue today. And they seriously take that into account into their decision making. It actually makes a big difference, right? Every single one of you can put in your address into on every level, on the federal level, find out who your senators and your, and your representative in, uh, in the House of Representatives is, at the state level, who your state senator and assemblyman is, uh, at the city level, if you live in New York City, who your councilman is, of course, the, you know, your mayor, your governor, all these different officials are people that are supposed to work for you. And you're supposed to have a say in how they govern, okay? And so whenever there's one of these uh, bills that's up for, uh, a debate, uh, you know, legislation that's being considered, it makes an enormous difference for citizens to express uh, their concern. It really does. Um, there, so, on a more individual level, uh, or as a as a congregation, there's a movement uh, of churches trying to uh, develop their own renewable energy sources, trying to run on solar. Um, it's called green. Uh, so, Green Faith is behind this too. You can get certified. Uh, where uh, you know, a team of engineers will come and examine your building and make sure that, um, and, and, and figure out if we can uh, become carbon neutral in, in, how, in how the building uses energy. Actually, the, the number one source of emissions, carbon emissions in New York City is buildings. I mean, it makes sense, there's buildings everywhere in New York. Um, anyone here have investments? 401k, anything like that. If you have investments, all right, there's a good chance if you, if you, if you, if you know, if you're not, aware of exactly where all that money is, if it's just invested in the stock market, there's a good chance that that money is invested in fossil fuel companies, companies like ExxonMobil and others that are benefiting from the destruction of the planet. Um, and there's a huge movement, it's called the divestment movement, to divest money from fossil fuel, from the fossil fuel energy and reinvest it in clean energy. Um, and this, is, this has been a movement that's spread throughout. Uh, is anyone here in college, grad school or uh, undergrad? All right, so this has been a major movement at universities where um, every, most universities have an endowment, all right, and that endowment is invested. Uh, and there's been a major movement at, uh, at, at, at so many, there's been hundreds of them now, where uh, students have managed to convince their board of trustees to divest their endowments from investing in fossil fuel companies and invest in clean energy instead. Uh, to date, I don't have that statistic here, but to date, um, over a trillion dollars has been divested from that from the fossil fuel industry and has been moved to clean energy, um, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of faith communities have been participating in this too. Um, I, don't, I don't know if uh, you know the, the Coptic Church operates the Coptic Orthodox Church operates that way in terms of its financials, but I know that many other Christian denominations have major endowments of their, of their own, and there's been a major movement to divest those endowments from from these from these. Uh, uh, bad things. There's something at the end here that I don't have. Oh, um, so when you go to websites like Green Faith and other interfaith websites on the climate change, they'll give you resources of, you know, every denomination will have some literature about climate change. And I can never find one that says Coptic Orthodox on it. Oh, and, and there'll be other Orthodox ones too. And every denomination will have, you know, there'll be so many links I'll see. I could, I could open one of these sites right now and show you. We need to put out there officially what our beliefs are on this issue. We need to, because even just putting it into writing makes a big difference, you know? Um, like, I, you know, these examples that I have here, all these different denominations, they, they, they'll put on, together conferences where leaders from all their different churches will come together, they'll put together a resolution, they'll publish this stuff, they'll introduce it into their Sunday school curriculum, they'll make an, they'll make an effort to publicly educate their congregations about this issue. And that's something we should keep in mind as well. Um, it could be something that is introduced into our Sunday school curriculum, at least making sure that we uh, tell our kids, our youth, to, um, to care, because this is all about them. This is about their future, you know? This affects young people more than anybody else. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about fighting the fossil fuel industry, but um, the last thing, you know, the most important thing you can do to fight climate change is just talk about it. You know, people, a lot of times people will tell me, oh, do I have to quit, you know, eating meat? You know, do, you know should I not use plastic straws anymore and all this stuff? I, oh, I do recycle, is that enough? Should I ride a bike instead of uh, driving a car? In reality, this is a societal issue. 
All right, uh, so to the extent that individual actions can make a difference, I'll be completely honest with you. They can if billions of people do all those things. But overall, this is at, this, at the level of you know, uh, systemic problems. And so it's gonna take a lot more than individual actions. And so one of the most important things you can do is just spread the message. The more and more people care about it, the more and more of an impact you have. These protests that we've had this year have been unprecedented. There's more attention being paid to this issue now than ever. And that's how it works with all issues, all right? If we do, if we continue this month, you know, this is the, you know, uh, convictions for a cause month. Whatever cause you, you, we, you know, we, we focus on, you know, and they're all related to climate change, whether it's poverty or, uh, you know, wh whatever it is, uh, something health related, um, civil rights, you know, talking about it is one of the most important things you can do. It's literally that simple sometimes, you know. Just spreading awareness okay, is a form of advocacy, okay? And so um, I appreciate you taking the time and coming through the weather to listen to that. Uh, I hope you've learned something today. Um, uh, happy to take any questions. That's, that's it for today. Hi, Kira. Thanks for coming. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, so I think that um, what you said in terms of this being a systemic problem um, really ties into this being something that can't be fixed today and is a long-term um, impact, right? So given that there's other things, uh, crises going on, there's hunger, there's poverty, um, mental health, there's all these other things that are happening in the world today, how do you... Um, one, help people to understand the importance of this besides showing all of these long-term implications so that they can take immediate action. How do you reconcile something like saying, okay, well, I would rather, um, you know, uh, look, cure, like, po not cure poverty, but um, help to reduce poverty, or I'd rather aid in hunger first because they don't see the immediate impact of, you know, writing to a policy, um, writing to, uh, sorry, a politician for policy. So like, how do you reconcile the importance of something like this in terms of long-term strategic view versus a short-term need to rectify a current issue? Great question. Um, it's a hard, oh, sorry. It's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat difficult to answer. Um, what I will say is that, first of all, um, I'm not here to tell you how to prioritize issues. As long as we, are, we care about doing something uh, as long as we feel we have a moral obligation to doing good in society, no matter what the issue is, I am all for it and I support you in doing that. This is one of many issues that we need to care about, okay? Um, I try to stress how interrelated that they all are. And so that's the thing, it's not really, they're not really siloed. Um, and neither is climate change anymore just a long-term issue. This is all happening now. You know, people are suffering from this right now. The solutions, yes, are long-term, like you say. and so. There's no quick fix to this because we've ignored it for so long. Um, but I just want to say, you know, I, I'm not here to tell you you should do, you should focus on this issue or you should focus on that issue. Whatever your interest is, follow it. Wherever your heart tells you, to, uh, you know, I want to focus on that, thank you. Then you should focus on that. As long as we are paying attention to what's happening with the world and doing our part to make, to leave behind a better one, then you know, I think, I think we are fulfilling our obligation as Christians. We can't all focus on the same issue, you know? We can't all be climate scientists, of course not. You know, we're all gonna have different concerns and we're all gonna, you know, do different things, but I just wanted to stress how this is existential for the planet. Literally, humanity's at risk, and one thing I wanna say about the long-term thing, one of the most Christian things you can do is, to, and, is put others before you, especially people that haven't even been born yet. You know, what does it say about us if we say, well, it's not going to affect me yet. It's going to, you know, decades down is when the real problem is going to happen. So I guess I don't have to worry about it now. That's just not the way that we're supposed to think as Christians. You know, we're, it's, we're supposed to be selfless. You know, we're supposed to be, you know, th think about your own kids one day, your grandkids. They're the ones who are going to pay the biggest price. We're already paying a price now, but the price gets bigger and bigger the longer we wait. And so we have an obligation to deal with it now. We've been... 
that are you know the argument to wait and to not feel the the pain right now you know it's, it's a problem for down the road has been used by fossil fuel companies actually to make us ignore this stuff and it's a lot of faith communities now that are coming and saying stop no more we are going to care for creation today we can't let this happen to our planet we can't let future generations suffer um did i answer all of your question <laughs> okay You're welcome thank you for that it's a very good question yeah, I just wanted to say that, like, I don't know, Kira, it's not just the fossil fuel industry that we need to worry about. Because, like, as you were saying about plastics and the ocean and all that stuff, all of these industries, they, put, they push the blame and responsibility onto us, saying recycle, do this, and this, do that. Whereas they are continuing to be the cause of the issue to begin with. Me and you, and, like, even if, like, 100,000 people were to recycle ev everything, is not going to change anything if we don't stop the source, which are these multi-billion dollar companies, which are producing and pushing all these products and all of this waste upon us. You're absolutely right. Uh, I didn't have, you know, this is one presentation, like I said, there's so much I could have gotten to. You're absolutely right, it's not just that industry. Um, the world economy functions on a system called capitalism. You know, it's basically uh, every man for yourself, make as much money as you can. That is, the, the global economy works on that principle. All right? The U.S. leads in that manner. And there are many industries that uh, have damaged the planet, have, have done all kinds of damage. Um, name an issue, name a problem in the world, and I will tell you the industry behind it. Any problem, there is somebody making money behind it. That's just how this world works, unfortunately. Um, and, and that's why I, I, I use that verse from the Bible, the, uh, what, what was it, the Timothy one? Uh, I think I missed it. <laughs> Boom, all right. Uh, yes, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It makes sense. Uh, do you remember that story in the Bible when Jesus walked into the temple and found the, the, the money lenders, were they? The people basically doing their business in the temple. And what did he do? He got angry. <laughs> basically flipped the tables, right? Is that the only time Jesus has like physically gotten angry like that? Had that kind of reaction in the Bible? It, it, that story touches me. It, it, it helps me explain a lot of what's going on in the world today. Um, and yeah, so thank you for that comment. You had something. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I love everything you have to say. Um, with regards to everything you said, with regard, with, um, what about population? We've doubled in population, more than doubled in the last 50 years. Um, we more people are working, uh, like people live longer. It just, like it's basically, it's an epidemic of itself that people. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Population is a big part of this. The world has a finite amount of resources and we are, the, uh, the global population is going exponentially. It's not just going by the same percentage every year. <laughs> the percentage increases every year. Um, you know, we are projected to have 10 billion people in a few decades. And we, we can't, we just literally can't sustain that. Um, now, that is a whole other, uh, you know, there are literally population scientists, people that just focus on population studies and, and migration control and things like that. Um, I don't have all the answers as to that. Um, I have part of an answer that's kind of controversial. It would get us into a whole other thing. But reproductive health care actually has a lot to do with population control. And I don't want to go down that road because then someone's going to tell me, you like abortion, it's going to go crazy, and it's going to be bad. All right, so let's just, <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to stop right there. But yes, population is a big part of it. We have finite resources, and there are too many people on the planet. It's true. So you touched on two obstacles um, to fighting climate change, one of them was hashtag Exxon New, which is basically them spreading misinformation for decades, and the other was money. And those two things are interrelated in, in the sense that a lot of the countries that have the biggest issue with climate change are the poorest countries of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, the both the, the governments of those countries and the businesses there, because the country overall is poor, they're going to look for the cheapest solution to 
maintain and develop their infrastructure, even if that solution is harmful long term. I think you touched upon it. It's a, in their minds, it's a short term solution and they have to think in short terms instead of long term risk. And so how do we combat both that way of thinking in terms of the misinformation and the fact that the, and the money issue, which essentially it's the, it's the poor that suffer, but at the same time you understand when those countries are as poor as they are, you, you get why they're doing what they're doing. Of course, of course. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, we've had annual, uh, so the, the UN's been doing these climate talks annually for decades, and we've gotten nowhere precisely because of this, because every country is at a different economic level, they have different needs, and the way the poor countries see it, they're not even responsible for this. I mean, like I said, the US, 5% of the population, a quarter of the emissions. You know, it's the rich countries that are most responsible for this, the poor ones that are suffering the most. And not to mention that as human beings, we're just not programmed to think in terms of the long term. Obviously, it's whatever's directly in front of us that we react to most strongly. Now, how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, I will say that we had a solution. The Paris Agreement was historic. In 2015, this was the first time that every country in the world, 197 countries, signed on to the same agreement. And we had set levels and everything. And what's happening now, unfortunately, is that those misinformation campaigns over decades, all right, have, I don't know how to say this without getting into controversial politics in this country, but one half of this country is, is basically in league with the corporations and, and you know, exploiting this climate denial movement for political gain. Um, and that's the Republican Party. There's no other way to say it. I have to, I have to just, it's the truth. Um, Donald Trump pulled this out of the Paris Agreement. He says that climate change is a hoax created by the Chinese. That's his famous quote. He doesn't believe his own scientists when they publish <laughs> studies. Literally, scientists from every agency of the United States will put out studies, and he says, I don't believe them. His own, his own people. Um, you know, there's, there is no shortage of reports talking about this and combating the misinformation. If we don't listen to the scientists, then there's not, not much else we can do. I mean, you know, we just have to... I think, I think in terms of addressing that, how do we, how do we deal with um, the poor countries part of it? Um, you know, I think we just always have to focus on doing our part. You know, I, I, I can't answer for, uh, you know, how much sacrifice every person has to make. All I know is that as Christians, we have to be leaders on this. You know, at us, you know, we have to do our part. We have to make sure that, you know, we are sacrificing as much as we can, all right? And then, and, and we have to put faith in God that he'll, he'll help us take it the rest of the way. I hope that's good enough to answer. <laughs> I know it's a, it's, a hard, it's a good question. Thank you. Comments, yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, for, for this point, I didn't even think it's very important until I saw that the church and uh, made all of these articles and books and all of this about it. And I always believe that the young politicians, as you were jo just talking, Young politicians, if we can reach for them and we can not make a movement, but at least we reach for them to, 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 to talk about it and, and how it's a responsibility for us, act of love from us as Christians and a responsibility that we not even, not, not just care about how it's injustice for the poor, injustice for the next generations and injustice for animals as well as the, uh, the global heating makes a problem also and how we can from all of this work and at least reach to young politicians to talk about it because the young politicians on uh, the political scene when they talk about something or make movements about something they force sometimes uh, leaders to talk about it and 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 someone like trump might might change her his act that's a great answer i don't even have anything to add to that no, I, I should have said that from the beginning the, the focus should be on young people. It's always young people that are the drivers of change, major change in society. It's always young people. And, those, and they're the people that are out in the streets right now. They're the ones who are pushing politicians to care about this kind of thing. And that's across political lines, right? So this, you know, the, the uh, resistance to doing something about this is usually at the level of the politicians and the leadership and the CEOs and stuff. But on the grassroots level, that's where the energy is. That's where we're gonna make the most progress. Talking to young people, lifting up the voices of the people who are gonna be affected the most by this. So that was a great answer, thank you. Uh, I, I should have mentioned that from the beginning.
fo the focus should always be on young people like us. We are the future, so um, that's how you that's how you deal with the long term problems. Most of the resistance, honestly, comes from people who are older. Um, they don't feel the urgency of it, and so thank you for that. Okay, Kiro. Um, remember there's a quote you just said about power and uh, love. Um, in the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about poor, poor countries and talking about the U.S. and you're saying uh, we have to start about, we start about ourselves. But uh, I think if we start, if you start by yourself, actually, like you are in a chance of other countries, like getting to be more powerful than you. And I think this is the problem because you need the resources to, to stay in power, in power. You need to the industry to be going on to stay in power. You need the money to stay in power. All this, all this cannot happen by cutting down and sacrificing your power um, and starting by yourself. Uh, I understand, like you're saying, we start by ourselves, but like, I think we're looking at a, a, a country, not, just, uh, not just, just individuals, you know? You got what I'm saying? Um, the country needs to be on top of the other countries, and that's how they think. Um, you can't just sacrifice that. You can't sacrifice the money. Are you saying that's how it is or how it should be? No, that's how it is right now. That's okay. how it is. The industry, I, the, the yeah. how, how the industry is going on right now, you need, you need all this, like the fossil industry, you need, you need all this kind of money that coming through. Actually, you don't. So let me, let me correct you there. So, so the way that the economy works today, the way the economy works today doesn't have to be that way. It, is, it, it exists that way. Because people who made money invested into laws to make them more money. Like I'll and give then, you an example: nuclear plants, let's say. Okay. And all and uh, like you know like uh, uh, war industry, like all this stuff yeah. affects affects global change, like affects like climate. Yeah, and they're okay. all bad. And <laughs> all bad, but you need it. You need it to stand power. Like this, this is my point. You need all these kind of things that you're thinking. Uh, it might. Oh, if we sacrifice the uh, on individual level, yes, I agree with you. But as a country, I don't think the United States can cut down a lot of these things uh, just because of the environment. I'm, I'm just like saying. They can, and we have the resources to other ways to get and to power. So, but we're not, you know. we, I mean, so first of all, the United States is by far the wealthiest country in the world. We spend 10 times more than any other country. Any, the next five countries combined spend less than we do on our military. We, the power is not the issue. The point is we focus too much on that, and we have to shift from that. You know, we, the, the U.S. Is, is the center of materialistic gain in the world. You know, it's always been about power here, so there's no shortage of that. I, we need to change things. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I, as I was saying, like, we don't, have to, we don't have to use those sources to keep our power because we have the technology and the resources to do it in a more ecological fashion. And because we are not going after those, China is now beating us. Russia is going to beat us. All these other countries are going to beat us to the punch because we decided to hold back and stick with the old route instead of trying to advance everything towards the new route. And not only that, I just want to say, guys, we are Christians. First and foremost, we are Christians, which means we care about the whole world. This is a global issue, you know? We can't speak about this in terms of American power must be sustained. Forget about that. You think, you think Christ cared about which country was going to be on top of the other? That should not be our concern. We are Christians. We need to care about every living person on this planet, regardless of what borders are drawn by politicians. Okay? Th that, that is who we are first and foremost, and that's who I am speaking to you today as. Not just as an American. I, yes, I want, we need to focus on the U.S. because that's where we are, and, we are and we're citizens of this country. But this is a global issue. All right? And we need to put the well-being of every country, especially the poorest ones, you know, at, at, at least at the level of our own. All right? this, is an, this is an issue where everyone is inter interdependent on each other. And so we cannot think of it in terms of who has power over who and maintaining, you know, uh, uh, maintaining our, pos our lofty position in the world. I understand that that's how it is, Ramos. It doesn't have to be that way. And there are many people in politics as well, many leaders who want to change that. Who, wanna, who, want, who have a completely different way of thinking about how the world should be run, how foreign policy and economics should work. And so we need to, we need to support those kinds of thinking. Um, and I mean, 
there, there are, I, I don't want to get into <laughs> specific candidates and stuff like that because we're in church and you know that's we don't need to go that far. But do research. There are plenty of people who are supporting a very different vision of how we should run the world. Okay. But great question though. Thank you, Ram. I know I, I can't get it right. <laughs> I'm loving this place. Just keep it coming. I can say it again. <laughs> All right. So a couple of things. So for a few points that we made. On a local level, and you're looking at Sub-Saharan Africa or Third World, it, it's really not a comparison to what we do here. And it, I don't think what we say in this room is going to affect what they're doing in the ground, because those people are doing it to survive, right? So a, an example of that is they need cooking oil. The majority of a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa use palm oil, which in order to extract palm oil, you literally burn palm leaves. Right, and the CO2 emissions from that is sky high as compared to squeezing olives and getting olive oil, right? But you're not gonna tell a man on the ground, no, don't do that, you can't, you can't do that, it's bad for the environment. They're gonna do it. And so we just have to accept that. Now if you're saying, now, coming back here to the US, there are changes that you can do and you can affect it on a local level. Where I have, well, and I, I'm not a disbeliever, I think all this stuff is going on, but I have issues with the divestment movement I, and some people bring up a lot of the money issues and so on. You, I don't think as a person you say, oh, I'm divesting my 401k or 403b, therefore I've helped this environment. I don't think you can say that. Guess what? Somebody else is going to make that. It's going to take your stocks. These companies can go private. These companies will continue to make money. So it's not. I don't think the investment movement is on it. And further go to if you look into the divestment movement from when it started it really some of the roots weren't really have anything to do with the environmental concerns they were more on the Israeli Palestine issue and you'd had sit-ins in, in colleges and you say oh There's divest different issues that I agree that I agree but I'm saying the divestment movement has some other roots that really you may agree or disagree with and you're gonna you can't promote it as just this one whole being um, so really do you, if you really believe divestment works I would like to see some results as to what that is. But telling people to divest out of their current investments out of these companies, you will be hard pressed to find one company in the entire stock exchange that even if they don't do anything, they don't have money in other companies or they don't rely on other companies who use fossil fuels, who use plastics, who use things that are greenhouse gas emitting. So it's really, it's a big web that if you really try to unravel all of it, guess what, even the healthiest company out there, even the farmers. You have a lot of animals, they're producing, uh, you have all these cows, now you're increasing CO2 emissions. You can't tell the farmers, stop growing, uh, stop growing cows. That's all I have. Um, so there's a lot there. I want to adjust a few of those things. Um, I don't even know where to start. All right, so first of all, on the divestment part, um, divestment is a method. Climate change is an extremely complex and an, an enormous threat to humanity. It's, it's such a difficult problem to deal with that we have to look at every possible solution. Anything that can possibly contribute even a little to fixing it should be looked at. I don't have all the solutions here. Of course, we didn't right. even come close to talking about all of them. And maybe divestment is not that effective. All I do know is that there is a pretty strong moral case to, to make as to not wanting to profit off of something that is harmful. That's all, that's all there is to it. I don't understand the stock market, I'm sure, as well as you do. But I do know that many, many <laughs> universities, for example, have, have uh, divested from fossil fuel companies. Many, uh, like I said, religious institutions have. Many uh, nonprofits. Uh, all kinds of endowments have. I'm telling you, it's been over a trillion dollars already that has been taken out of the fossil fuel industry and reinvested. That's the most important part. Reinvested in solar. And, and wind energy and, and products like that. Now, when it comes to the palm oil stuff, listen, I understand that we're not going to, like there are, you know, there are people that are worse off and we're not going to be able to change attitudes everywhere and we shouldn't have to. But remember, 71% of emissions are by 100 companies only. This is a com very unequal issue. This is an issue that is caused mostly by a few rich people and hurting the vast majority of poor people. So I don't, I'm not worried about the poor people in sub-Saharan Africa using palm oil, right? That's not, that's not the problem, right? It's, it's, it's governments and corporations and just the richest ones that need to change their policies. 
Right? So we, we, don't, we don't need to be discouraged just because we can't get every person in the world to recycle or something. I don't okay. think it's discouragement, but I don't think that only a few top people agree or want to burn fossil fuels. A as you listed in all your statistics, it's not, you said only 59% of people believe that uh, yep. current, the current situation or is it, we're being affected by the environment and we're contributing to it. Yeah. 40, the other 41% that's not 1% of America, that's 41%. So I'm saying mm -hmm. there are people out there who aren't in the top who do <coughs> believe that w using coal and spending as much money on gasoline is okay. So I don't think it's for us to say, oh, we just have to target companies. Yeah, of course, you can speak out and you can go to your representatives and you can take actions in your own, green, in your own CO2 carbon footprint, right? But again, even if you go invest into solar. Those solar panels have to be made by something, right? Yeah. And those wind wind farms have to come out from somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of energy that needs to be put into those things, Yes. right? And so guess where those companies get their stuff from? Carbon producing companies. So at the end of the day, we, we are in a cycle and I could say, you say, well, you're shifting your energy from these future productions and yeah, you're gonna be able to do, you're gonna, with the, with the wind farm, you will rely less over time or on greenhouse gases, which is fine. But I don't think you could simply say, we've taken out one trillion out of these people. That money went back into those companies. Somebody else put that one trillion back into those companies, correct? I'm not sure exactly how to answer, but how, how about this? Yeah. Um, maybe I didn't do a good job of laying out all the solutions. Renewable energy is not the only thing. Um, for example, preserving rainforests is one of the number one things we can do to combat climate change. Because all those rainforests absorb the carbon dioxide and give us oxygen in return. So that's a huge thing we can do. Agreed. Nature itself is designed to protect itself. And so you protect the animals and the trees and, and, and biodiversity, you, you save the planet in a way right there. So that, that part of it, the economic transformation is going to be painful and difficult and long. And you're right. I, you know, don't have all the solutions. It's not going to be easy. The investment is not a clean process. It's 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 really hard to make progress on that front. And and you're right. I mean, capitalism has a way of just the money circles around. It's true. It's very hard to get to to remove money from 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 pe people from profiting off of harmful things. But I want to point to something uh, like an example of successful divestment. The apartheid movement in South Africa. That was one of the most successful examples of divestment being used to take money away from corporations who were um, operating in South Africa during the apartheid regime where the, you know, the white minority ruled over the black majority. And that, that's where the inspiration, I think, for the climate divestment movement came from. But I think, again, overall, you are right. Economic transformation is complex and hard and difficult. And there are many other solutions to it. I think we just need to focus on the fact that we have a crisis and we need to look at anything we can do to take care of it, to, to contribute to it. I hope that answers, uh, addresses <laughs> your point. But thank you, I appreciate it. Kiro, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, David here, proud Canadian. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I, I agree with everything you said. I think where I struggle in these kinds of things is as a Christian, um, there's certain things, like you said, we're not there's no way in reversing this as much as we can try. Our goal is to minimize it. And sometimes I feel like a lot of things happen for a reason. And God, it's all part of God's plan. So God talks about, like in Revelations, it talks about increasing natural disasters. And these are signs of the end of times and things like that. So, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into that. But the whole idea is I'm more on the side of what can we do at a local level to feed the poor and get people out of poverty and things that we were asked to do directly because as we can tell from this discussion are we ever really going to have an impact is there any way to really reverse this like no the world is going to get warmer and our goal is to keep it at two degrees instead of three and maybe it's all just a part of god's plan so that's where i struggle as a christian like technically we should all be vegetarians by your logic because the meat producing industry is one of the biggest polluters in the world is what my understanding right so, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, hey, hey, these are valid concerns. I, I want to address two points you made. So, the, the God's plan part. Um, 
I sh I've always struggled with that in my, in my spiritual life as well. You know, how do, I, how do I make sense of why something terrible is happening, you know, knowing that God is all, almighty and all-powerful and omnipresent, you know. But at the same time, I think, as Christians, we, we have to believe that we have agency, all right, and that we have a responsibility to, to do God's work ourselves. So we can't sit back and say whatever happens, well, that's going to be God's plan, you know. The, the, and, the, you know, we can't blame the bad things on him. You know, when bad things happen, it's because good people didn't step up, all right? And as Christians, we have to look at it as some, we, I refuse to just, uh, you know, say that this is going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it, and, and that's it. And maybe we can make sense of it later, all right? This is a disaster, and it happened for reasons, reasons that we know why it happened. We know how it happened, and we know how to fix it. We have most of the solutions, you know, if we just listened to the scientists, we, we, we would be out of this disaster. We, we wouldn't have even been in this situation if we had done that decades ago. And so I, I understand why you would think that way, but I ref, as a Christian, I refuse to be hopeless, I think. I, I, I am hopeful. I'm, I'm a, maybe I'm too much of an optimist, but I believe that we have agency as Christians to do God's work and not just to see what happens out there in the world and say, well, you know, Maybe there's a good reason for that. Okay, I will just say, I, my point is not that it's like hopeless. I'm just saying, <laughs> where can we better focus to make real changes? As like, I feel like Says. climate change is, like, I, like we can recycle and we can try to, I mean, technically we shouldn't be flying. I mean, the, as the airline industry increases, that is also a huge cause of pollution too, is my understanding. So these are things I don't think we could live without anymore. But I just feel like, there is a bigger plan that's part of it, and we should be. If I'm, if I'm going to spend a night, I sorry, I hate to play devil's advocate, but I'm, I'm instead of, you know, rallying my uh, congressman, um, if I can go feed feed the poor or go collect money or donate money that I'm, I might be making off fossil fuel stocks. But if I can donate that money to Africa or to Egypt or something else, I feel that's where I would personally be doing more on the uh, you know grassroots you're talking about I am not telling you to not do any other good at all that is absolutely not what I am saying and in fact if, if, if you come out of today and decide that you just want to focus your efforts on some other good thing then I will be happy this is one of many issues and what happens with climate change because it's such a broader and complex issue and because it has lots of long-term effects this is the arguments that the devil as advocates use and the corporations use to to try to distract us. They say, well, shouldn't your time be used on something like that, something where you can have a more immediate effect? Or shouldn't you focus on recycling? Or, oh, you took an air, uh, airplane flight last week? Well, then you're a hypocrite. Or, oh, did you forget to recycle that 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 uh, um, that Coke uh, bottle that you were just drinking from? These are, these are not the things that are responsible for the crisis, right? They, like, Th those individual actions are not what you need to be concerned with. The reason why I mentioned the Congress and, and, and you know and legislation is because it's going to take that level of uh, change at the society level, policy, um, to actually make a difference here. We, we don't need to feel ashamed because of uh, you know these little actions that we take in our lives that are construed to damage the environment. They're not the most damaging things. Like I said, this is a very unequal issue. The vast majority of the world is not responsible for it. It's very few people that are. They're the ones that profit off of it. Does that answer most yeah. of your question? Yeah. Sorry. I, yeah. But also, again, if your climate change is not your issue, please go help the homeless. Yeah. That, that'll be great. <laughs> All right. Melissa, you had a question? Sorry. I, sorry. I just have one here, and I'm coming to you. Yes. Um, actually, as we're Christian, we should never be like passive or hopeless or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, new issues, like 40 years ago, the climate um, issue wasn't there or people were not like the world were not was not really aware of it but we have to be updated as Christians because we care we yeah. otherwise will be like you know dissolved in this world like because that would not gonna be exist so we have to be updated well what would happen when another issue comes up so we have to act on it if we just you know turn around from the environmental issues you know we're gonna turn around from another issues like in the future and that stuff so we have to as you just said at least the moral like you know thinking or the moral like effort about it like it's 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 even enough so. thank you uh, that's a great point uh, I absolutely that thank you for the help <laughs> um, I, I understand the 
work in terms of how to deal with this issue. But yeah, we have a moral responsibility to take it one step at a time. You know, just again, this is progress right here. Like I said, the one most important thing you can do to combat climate change is to talk about it and spread awareness. And that's true of any issue, any cause that you have conviction to, to support and to do something about, spreading awareness makes a difference, especially in a democracy. You know, the more people care about something, the more of a difference it makes. It takes time, but that's how change happens. Okay, oh, Melissa. Yeah, so I don't have a question as much as a comment, just hearing what everyone's saying. Please. I think, um, I think the, the point, and, and this is very relatable to, to how we serve the homelessness. Are we going to eliminate homelessness when we go out to serve? No, we're not. So essentially we're doing, we're taking our, we're doing our part and taking smaller steps to try to mitigate that circumstance. And I think what Giro's saying is similar when it comes to, to climate change. These are things that go hand in hand things that can be worked on. There are like tangible solutions that we can take and tangible actions that we can take to uh, you know, sort of mitigate this, this situation. So I mean, I'm never about the idea of, oh, well, what is my impact going to do? Like, no, it makes a difference. And if we think that way about everything in life, we're going to sit at home on our couches all day long and do nothing. So it's a dangerous thought, I think, personally. It's a dangerous road to go down that, well, what is my, what am I, what is my, you know, throwing my straw out or not using a straw, how, how is that going to be impactful? And it's, it's just dangerous to think that because we, we do that all the time. So I think, again, the point of Kiro's talk really is just that th these things go hand in hand. So yes, you should be serving, um, doing local things, um, while at the same time really trying to petition and do, to do bigger things as well that, that can impact um, uh, like in the, the climate and issue on, on a larger scale. So. Thanks a lot, Melissa. That was yeah, that helped drive the point I was trying to make home. Um, and again, th this is not a topic that you finish talking about in one lecture, not by any means. You know, I could have had, I could have done this over a, a, a month, over a summer of, of bi-weekly uh, lessons where we would have talked about all the solutions in more depth. Um, but I, the broader point about how we approach this is very important. You have agency as as a as a creation of Christ, as part of creation having a piece of God in you, you have power. You have the ability to change things on this planet, all right? Especially because you're not alone. You have a church. We're all together here. It's not individual actions. We are a community. Communities make change. And so that should be a source of inspiration for you as well, okay? Anybody else? Thank you guys so much for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kiara, once again. Um, we really appreciate your zeal, your passion for this subject. Um, I pray that uh, your zeal will galvanize and prompt action and, and lead to a bigger movement. Um, because like we've discussed before, um, there's different avenues of service. Um, and you know, for us to think that we're going to make a huge impact by one act of service, it, it does happen. And like Melissa said last week during the sandwich drive, one of the qu quotes that we used by Mother Teresa said, if you can't feed 100, then just feed one person. Um, so it's very important to uh, realize that one act, of one act of service does make a huge difference. Um, also, there was a quote I wanted to share that brought home uh, a point that you said, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. So let that sit in. Uh, it's a Greek proverb, according to Google, but we don't know. Mark, you can uh, fact check that later. So anyways, welcome. Happy Monday, everyone. Um, happy December. Like Abuna announced during the beginning, we are starting a new theme. It's called uh, Conviction to Causes. So just like... Um, Kiro just did, you know, he had a true conviction and it's leading him for uh, a greater cause. So that's gonna be our theme for, uh, for this month. Uh, a few announcements, every, can everyone see the announcements behind me? All right, perfect. Um, welcome, I wanna say welcome to the new faces, our regular faces, and um, if people we haven't seen in a while, I'm glad to see you guys. Uh, welcome back. Um, it is an act of ours, our practice of ours, that if you do see someone new, or someone old, do uh, go introduce yourself, greet one another, um, 
with a holy kiss if you'd like. <laughs> I just went down that path. I didn't realize I did that. But anyways, and if you have any questions, my name is Minardos. I can help direct you to anything that you need. Um, so every Tuesday, the church is open for personal prayer from 3 to 6 p.m. So on your lunch break, if you'd like to come and say a personal prayer or just have a long time, quiet time, please take advantage of that. That's every Tuesday, 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, every Wednesday, we're going to have early liturgy at 6.30 a.m. during the Advent fast. So Wednesday at 6.30 a.m. before work, if you want to catch a blessing and a liturgy, it's 6.30 a.m. We try to finish around 8.45 so you can make it to work around 9. Um, also, every Thursday, we have Bible study. The doors open at 7.15. We try to start by 7.30. Currently, we are doing um, the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 4. We're still on Chapter 4. Also, December 13 to 14, that's this upcoming Friday and Saturday, we have we are hosting the Mukattam Benefit Craft Sale. Um, for some of you that know and do, or those of you who don't know, uh, the Mokattam is an area in Egypt known as the Zebelin. So there are people and volunteers dedicated to this cause uh, for, you know, decades now. And what they do is they're selling goods and items that were produced by the women in the Zebelin, men and women, and it's all craft sale. And that's going to be available. Sorry? Oh, just women. Sorry. <laughs> um, also, very important. Exciting announcement. Saturday, December 21st is our third annual Christmas concert. It is being hosted in our home in this hall. Um, as you see, we're starting to prepare. Uh, we have some cool announcements in regards of performers. We have someone by the name of Joseph Tewedros. Am I right? He's a famous Oud player. He's coming all the way from the United Kingdom. He's going to come perform. Also, can I announce? Okay, we have two special guests. They're making a cameo. That is also um, Emba Angelos, also coming from the UK, who will come and grace us. And his grace, Bishop David, our diocese leader. He will come and be in attendance. So please sign up. I'll tell you exactly how to sign up after. Uh, Sunday, December 29th, we have a Barry Mission service. It's a beautiful service, a beautiful um that we do, that we partake in. Uh, it's going to be from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. That's on Sunday, December 29. Um, so that's going to be a dinner service. If you have any questions, please um, speak to Sandy. Sandy, if you could raise your hand. It's limited space. So please, if you are interested in doing it, it's a beautiful service. We do it every so often. Um, and if you want to take the blessing, please speak to Sandy after the meeting so you can sign up for that. Also, January 24th to the 26th, we have our third annual SMSM Winter Retreat. The theme is Holy, Holy, Holy. First Holy is H-O-L-E-Y. Second Holy W H O L L Y, And the third is H-O-L-Y. As you can see the progression, that is the theme. Um, that will be January 24th to the 26th. More information to come on that in terms of who we are announcing um, who's going to be speaking during the, the, uh, the retreat. So if you want to sign up for the annual Christmas concert and the SMSM winter retreat, uh, they are on Eventbrite. So if you want to go on Eventbrite, you could purchase it. But as an incentive, since those who are present tonight, I will have the square um, set up, the iPad, and you could purchase these tickets tonight, um, and the incentive is you forego the event bright, event bright fees, which could be a, you know, a little much. So if you guys want to forego those fees, we will have the square set up. You could sign up. Keep in mind, this place has a capacity, so keep that in mind if you want to sign up for the Christmas concert. That's going to sell out pretty fast. Also, for the winter retreat, that also has a capacity and limit, and I would suggest signing up because if you guys come to us, January 20th and tell me, Minardo, Sabuna, I want to sign up, and we're at capacity, we have a waiting list, I, we can't help you. We want you guys to come, so we're trying to do everything we can to incentivize you to sign up as soon as possible. Um, you had a question?
Holy, holy, holy. Hmm. I think you should sign up and you're going to find out once you come and attend. That's the secret. Um, but we will, we will share more context. Holes, holy, wholesome, and then holy. There you go. Sure. Go ahead. It's a good question that we'll address after. I think that's fine. That, that's a particular dilemma for you. But in general, I would encourage you guys to sign up as soon as possible because, like I said, there is capacity. And I know we as Egyptians or as youth, we love to uh, wait last minute. I encourage you to do it as soon as possible. So that's basically it. Anything else, Abuna? Oh, sorry. What? Oh, guys, also. How can I forget? If you are not already doing this, please follow us on all our social media platforms. Our handle is SMSMNYC. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. We are on Facebook. We have our website. You could actually come up when you're done and just open up your camera and utilize the barcode. It'll scan it and it'll open up to um, all, our social, all, all our social media platforms. Also, something very important in light of the giving season. If some of you, some of you have already seen this, we actually have a fundraiser um, Facebook page. So we're raising funds for the church. Um, there are no fees. Uh, it's through Facebook. Um, you could also use this barcode to go straight to the fundraising campaign. Um, so if you want to donate, we also have uh, easytithe.com. You could donate that way. Uh, you could do a one-time payment or a recurring payment. Um, and we utilize Amazon Smile. Who here shops on Amazon? All right, don't lie. I know all of you shop. No, I'm just joking. So what they do is they use 0.05% of the proceeds of what you shop for towards a um, nonprofit that you choose. So please utilize that, especially now during Christmas time when we're going to do a lot of our online shopping. Um, so that's basically it for now. If you have any questions, you come speak to me after, um, and I can address any of your uh, issues or questions. So also, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, this is the first Monday that we're showcasing the brand new chairs that we've been funding, fundraising for for a while. So um, round of applause. We got new chairs, guys. I hope you guys are feeling comfy. Um, they're beautiful. They're very nice. And we want to continue, obviously, improving um, everything that we have to serve you guys better. Oh, right. Okay. Also, another um, sneak peek for next week, next Monday, what we're going to have is we're going to have a special screening for the movie Noon. Uh, has anyone watched it before? It's on Amazon Prime. Um, Abuna Michael, Danny Bulis, um, a gentleman by Paul Benjamin and, and Olivia. Um, there are a group of people who worked really hard to create this short film called Noon. Um, so we would love to invite you guys and, and come next week, and we're going to have a screening here. So that should be very, very nice. So what we're going to do for right now, also, really quickly, before we stand up for prayer and end um, the service, is I'm going to need your help, guys, uh, just moving around chairs. So whoever's willing to volunteer, that would be greatly appreciated. And we want you to know that, you know, every week, you know that we have service those who volunteer we greatly greatly appreciate it so we're very thankful for you guys um so that's all we need after the service is done is just help moving around some things um and reorganizing so last announcement Okay. Okay, so the, the Buna who's speaking at our retreat um, is requesting that we fill out a survey. It's just a few simple questions. Um, and obviously he wants us to do that so we can prep um, and he could serve us better uh, during the retreat. So we're going to post that link on all social media platforms and the WhatsApp groups. Um, so be on the lookout for that. That's really important if you do plan on attending our 
um, winter retreat. Once again, after I'm going to have the square set up, please sign up to get your um, Christmas tickets, your Christmas uh, concert tickets, and your winter retreat tickets, okay? So we're going to stand up for prayer right now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Through the intercessions of the Theoto, St. Mary, O Lord, grant us the forgiveness of our sins. We worship you, O Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit for you have risen and saved us a mercy of peace a sacrifice of, of praise O oh Lord hear us as we pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the fellowship and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you all.